Thank you, and take the floor away from me. If I <laughs> uh, when, when I was asked what I wanted to talk about, I uh, offered a number of, uh, of, of topics, most of which were based on research that I had completed and was nice and polished and <laughs> published and all the rest. And there was only one topic that was very rough and uh, was a work in progress and hadn't even been put into the form of a first draft, and wouldn't you know it, that's what, that's what you wanted. So be warned, this is going to be disorganized, it's going to be fragmentary, it's really bits and pieces, quite disjointed, and the conclusions, such as they are, are very tentative. Um, some time ago, uh, I was approached by, by Stephen Weitzman at Stanford and Sylvester Jones at, excuse me, Sylvester Johnson at Northwestern, who are doing a book on the FBI and religion. Um, they asked me if I wanted to do something on the FBI and Muslims after 9-11. I had already done a piece on religion in general and secrecy after 9-11, and I think that's probably why they got in touch with me. And I was tempted uh, in part because uh, the rather fraught relationship between the Muslim community and the government after 9-11 is probably the most significant collision between a major religious group and government really since uh, the uh, conflict between the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints and the government in the latter part of the 19th century, although I, I'm not equating the two in terms of magnitude and, and severity. So in a moment of weakness, I said, well, why not? Sure, I'll do it. Uh, it was, as it turned out, a somewhat rash move, not because it's an uninteresting topic, far from it, uh, but because it's turned out to be a fiendishly hard subject to get a grip on. Uh, partly, of course, for the obvious reason that a lot of critical material is still cloaked in secrecy. Uh, but also because uh, the more we think we know about the subject, the slipperier it gets as we start to examine it. Uh, what I want to concentrate on today are three elements that I've been looking at. Um, they're not all clearly connected to one another, but I think once I'm finished, they'll hopefully begin to, to, to to become uh, more cohesively related. The first is the contours of the American Muslim community. The second is the limits on FBI investigative practices. And the third, of course, is what we know, or at least think we know, of FBI investigations of American Muslims since September 11, 2001. The demographics of American Islam uh, has for a long time now been a contested area. Uh, this really for two reasons, I think. One, of course, is that there is no official religious census in the United States for constitutional reasons, although in fact a lot of religious groups would very much like there to be because they'd like to have that kind of data, but in fact the government doesn't collect it. And secondly, because size estimates of small religious groups, at least reliable size estimates of small religious groups, turn out to be very hard to make. And if you look at estimates of the size of the American Muslim community, uh, they range all the way from 2 million to 9 million. Uh, and a lot of them cluster between 5 million and 7 million, although in fact the most reliable survey estimates have been far lower. The most reliable survey estimates tend to be in the 2 to 3 million range. There's a 
uh, Pew Center survey that was made in 2007 that now tends to get, I think, cited most frequently, and that puts it at 2.35 million. Uh, whatever the number, uh, what is also important are significant divisions within the community. At the time of the 9-11 attacks, about two-thirds of the community were foreign-born. This is a result of the liberalization of immigration laws in, in the mid-1960s. Roughly 40% of all the immigrants came from the Arab Middle East and North Africa, and um, at least a quarter from South Asia with Pakistanis, the largest group of the South Asians. There are another 20 to 30 percent of all American Muslims who are African Americans, either born into the faith or converts. And then you get into the issue of uh, where the followers of Elijah Muhammad went, and I'm, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, in terms of geographical distribution, not as concentrated as their co-religionists in Britain. It's a more diffuse community, uh, much more spread out, although there are exceptions. There are concentrations, notably in Michigan around Dearborn and in Southern California. We'll get to a Southern California case a bit later about a third of them in the east, about a quarter each in the south and in the central uh, Great Lakes, and about 20% uh, in, the, in the west. Uh, in retrospect, if the immigrants that make up the backbone of the American Muslim community had gotten here, let's say, 50 years earlier. Uh, it seems to me the interaction of American Muslims with law enforcement and the government generally would be and would have been quite different. Uh, the problems, to a, at least to some extent, have been, I think, a function of the fact that uh, we're dealing here with a community that has only very partially acculturated itself. Uh, and while there are Muslim self-defense organizations, uh, they have not yet found their footing and they're dealing with a rank and file that has not yet adjusted itself to American life and not yet had the self-confidence that other immigrant groups had when they've been in this country for a couple of generations. Uh, so that's the demographic side of it. Uh, let me look secondly at the, at, the, at the FBI side, beginning with the investigation procedures. And if we look at FBI investigation procedures, we really have to take this back, uh, what, uh, over 40 years uh, to understand what's going on. We have to take it back all the way to the early 1970s. Uh, in 1971, a group of activists broke into an FBI office, some of you I see nodding heads, in the aptly named town of Media, Pennsylvania, and stole a large number of FBI documents. Um, the individuals involved were never caught and identified by the FBI, although last year they identified themselves. Uh, by that time, of course, the statute of limitations had long since run out. 
the uh, documents that they stole revealed that the Bureau had been engaged in massive political intelligence gathering. Obviously not a secret to us given the predilections of J. Edgar Hoover, but this was documentary evidence. They passed it on to a number of newspapers, some of which did not publish it, some of which did. Uh, eventually, some of this stuff got out, and it became one of a number of factors that led in 1975 to the investigations of a Senate committee led by Senator Frank Church of Idaho, generally referred to simply as the Church Committee. Uh, this is, of course, against the background of the Watergate scandals. The Watergate break-in took place in 1972. Uh, the Church Committee uh, revealed a whole series of abuses of executive power, including abuses of the, of the FBI involving FBI activities that had nothing to do with uh, law enforcement. Uh, as part of the Watergate scandal, as uh, you doubtless know, uh, the Attorney General of the United States, John Mitchell, was prosecuted and sentenced to prison. Uh, Richard Dixon's successor as president uh, was uh, Gerald Ford. We won't go into Spiro Agnew, that's tangential to all of this. Uh, Gerald Ford, who becomes president on Richard Nixon's resignation, uh, finds it necessary to appoint as Attorney General someone who is squeaky clean, the antithesis of uh, John Mitchell. And he chooses as his Attorney General, Edward Levy, President of the University of Chicago, renowned lawyer, former dean of the University of Chicago Law School. And in response to what now is known of the FBI's um, activities, this is now a year after the church committee hearings have begun, in 1976, Edward Levy issues a document called Domestic Security Investigation Guidelines for the FBI, popularly known for a while as the Levy Guidelines and later simply as FBI Guidelines. These were the first written guidelines for the conduct of FBI investigations. Subsequent attorneys general, uh, William French Smith, Richard Thornburg, and others uh, modified and somewhat loosened the guidelines in succeeding years, but didn't make really big changes in them. However, really big changes, not surprisingly, came after September 11th. By that time, of course, of the Attorney General is John Ashcroft. In 2002, John Ashcroft significantly loosened the guidelines. Uh, to simplify matters, uh, the big changes that Ashcroft <coughs> made in the guidelines are twofold. First, he made it possible for agents to act with much less oversight by their superiors. And secondly, he introduced something that seems si simple and straightforward, but in practice wasn't. He explicitly gave uh, FBI personnel permission to enter public places and attend events open to other citizens <coughs> on the same basis as other citizens. That, in effect, made it possible for FBI agents to attend events at mosques without necessarily identifying themselves as agents. 
the other thing that Ashcroft did, besides significantly loosening the um, FBI guidelines, was he gave the FBI the mission of preventing terrorist acts. Now, that's immensely important because the FBI had never been a crime prevention organization. That had not been its, uh, it, its mission. It had always been oriented toward acting after the fact. In other words, what the FBI did is it hunted down wrongdoers, it hunted down criminals, arrested law violators, and collected evidence so that they could be prosecuted in federal court. It didn't try to prevent crimes from happening. As a matter of fact, I was at, I was at a, 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 a terrorism conference after Ashcroft had made this change, and an irate FBI agent got up and said, we're not in the, we're not in the prevention business. We don't know how to do prevention. This isn't what we do. And he just went on. He just went ballistic over this. Uh, what, in effect, Ashcroft was doing was putting the FBI back in the intelligence gathering business that had gotten them in trouble in the first place. Later attorneys general further loosened the guidelines, which by now, by the way, were book length, where <laughs> Levy's were only a few pages. Uh, and the question emerged, of course, is how well did FBI agents know what the guidelines actually allowed them to do or not do? And in fact, in the fall of 2005, the FBI inspector general tried to determine what FBI agents actually knew about the guidelines. And they went to several field offices and they surveyed agents about because. Every time the guidelines changed, there was supposed to be a training program that told agents what the changes were and what was now permitted or forbidden. And what the inspector general's uh, conclusions were was that uh, these training programs were very spotty and a lot of agents really had only the foggiest idea of what was now permitted or, or forbidden because this thing was very complicated. These were not simple rules any longer. Uh, this had gotten Byzantinely complex. So there's this whole guideline business and the question of how it operates within a, an extremely large and bureaucratically a complex organization. Uh, then finally, there's the issue of what's actually happening between the FBI and the Muslim community. And this is obviously the toughest part. It's unfortunately based on fragmentary anecdotal evidence. Many in the Muslim community believe that there's been widespread FBI surveillance despite public denial by high FBI officials that that is not the case, there is enough evidence to suggest that there has certainly been some and probably substantial uh, surveillance uh, of at least some kind. For example, between 2001 and 2003, the FBI monitored over 100 Islamic sites in the Washington area for signs of radiation as though they're somehow, you know, what, having nuclear weapons. Now, they did not actually physically enter the buildings in those cases. They did the monitoring from, from outside. Uh, the incident we know the most about happened in Orange County, California in 2007. Now, this, as I mentioned before, is an area with a large Muslim population. We know about it from two sources. One is uh, the, uh, the actions of journalists who reported on it. And the other is because um, the ACLU and individual Muslims brought suit against the FBI in this case. Uh, I, I, as I 
tell you this story, there are going to be a lot of qualification, there going to be a lot of places where I'm going to say apparently or probably. And the reason for this is that um, we're not really sure um, about some of what happened. The Bureau apparently hired a guy named Craig Montiel to pose as a, I can see a Craig Montiel fan back there. Not a fan. Uh, Craig, <laughs> Just recognize the name. Okay. <laughs> to pose as a potential Muslim convert at the Islamic Center of Irvine, California. So he got infiltrated as part of something called Operation Flex. Now, what the FBI did not know about Craig Montiel, but should have known, uh, is that Craig Montiel was a convicted con man who had already served time for forgery. Talk about, talk about the gang that couldn't shoot straight. He had already served time for forgery, and shortly before the FBI hired him, he had been in the process of bilking two women out of $100,000, what his game was at that point. This is like weeks before they hired him is he would, he would go into a fitness center and he'd be working the machines next to some attractive woman and he would make, start making conversation and indicate to her that he was a fitness expert. And not only was he a fitness expert, but he knew all sorts of high-powered athletes. And the reason that he knew them was that he sold them human growth hormones at a tremendous markup and he had a lead on some really, really great potential sales. The only thing was he didn't have quite enough money to buy the human growth hormone, but if he got $50,000, he would sell it at a tremendous markup and share these huge profits with, with whoever was able to supply him the $50,000, uh, which he would have for this lucky investor by the next day. <laughs> and of course, when the next day came, he said, oh, you know, the human growth hormone hasn't arrived yet, but I got another customer, and if I can only get another batch of human growth hormone for another 25,000, and, and you, you know the, you know the, the, uh, the game. Anyway, uh, that was what he was about to do before he was hired by the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> uh, his own description of what went on in the mosque may not be entirely reliable, <laughs> but, but, uh, Apparently, Operation Flex, uh, in the description in the plaintiff's documents, involved audio recording in mosques all over Southern California, installing electronic surveillance equipment in mosques all over Southern California, and identifying individuals with particular religious characteristics, in other words, have, have you gone on the Hajj, et cetera, et cetera. However, as this thing went on month after month, and Montiel and began to ingratiate himself with more and more people at the Islamic Center, he changed his, uh, his, his conversational gambit, and he began to talk to people about the duty of Muslims to take violent action and about his access to weapons. And at that point, the leaders of the mosque got really upset. They got so upset that they called the FBI and they said, there's this guy in the mosque who's talking about violence and we don't like it. And they went to court and they got a restraining order against Montiel barring him from the mosque, and at that point, obviously, his activities there ended. 
he appears to have been paid $177,000 for his work. Now, as I've indicated, how much of his account is true, we can't be sure, but there is abundant independent documentary evidence clearly linking Montiel to the FBI. For example, we know that he signed a non-disclosure agreement with the FBI. That's a matter of public record. So he certainly had some connection with the FBI. Uh, the reason why there's this measure of uncertainty about his account is that the case never went to trial. The reason it never went to trial was that Attorney General Eric Holder invoked the state secrets privilege, arguing that describing Operation Flex would harm national security. So the case ended. Uh, there, was no, there was no resolution. Uh, there's one other side to this, and it's one that I'm just beginning to get into, and that is that simultaneously with whatever surveillance may or may not have been going, or probably was going on, the FBI was also engaged in what they called a community outreach program to American Muslims. In other words, an open public program of going to mosques and going to Muslim community meetings and trying to establish rapport with the Muslim community, presumably in order to um, open up channels of communication so that Muslims would bring any uh, suspect information to the Bureau. Uh, as far as one can determine, that program has not worked well either uh, for a number of reasons, partly because uh, the presentations that agents made at these meetings sometimes struck Muslims as either uh, inaccurate or insensitive. Uh, sometimes because of uh, um, things over which the Bureau had no control. For example, uh, the ACLU uh, was able to secure through FOIA requests reports of uh, community outreach programs that had been written by agents after they met with uh, Muslim groups and they found that when agents returned after these meetings and wrote up sort of a summary of what went on at these outreach meetings, they called these reports intelligence reports, uh, which then, and when that uh, was made public, uh, it then, uh, uh, it, it, it then, was perceived by the Muslim community as, well, the, this outreach is then just a guise for spying. So, in a sense, uh, uh, the surveillance and the perception of surveillance sowed suspicion and hostility, the attempt to secure cooperation and mutual uh, and, and, and mutual interest through outreach uh, seems to have uh, failed uh, for much the same reason uh, it was a, uh, there were in, there was an inconsistent policy that seems to have gotten uh, the worst of, uh, of both worlds uh, let me stop at this point and ask uh, Questions and uh, comments. Yeah. Any question? At any point, as you're writing this paper, do you plan on bringing in media coverage of these issues? Because that has had a profound effect, I think, on political discourse at a higher level. Well, it depends on whether it deals directly with with the with the FBI. Uh, I I think if it deals with 
with the perception of Muslims, which obviously is a significant topic, it's really a different, it, it's a related subject, but it's a subject in itself. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of stereotyping. Uh, and uh, there's the question of the degree to which that kind of stereotyping has affected the perception of Muslims by FBI agents themselves. Uh, that's and vice versa. It, what, in and a way, versa. unknowable. Uh, around, let's see when this would have been, I guess around 2005, I was one of four scholars who was asked to give presentations to a group of around 30 FBI terrorism analysts. And um, we met and we had, you know, sort of nice little presentations for them. This was in, in it was at the American Academy of Religion meetings, but they were held in Washington that year, so we went over to to the, to the bureau, and uh, after we did, made our presentations, I can't remember who among us said to these assembled people, how many of you speak Arabic? And out of the 30 or so, three people raised their hand. How many of you have read the Koran? And about two or three people raised their hand. And then finally, they began talking. And they indicated how embarrassed they were by their own ignorance. Uh, and how uncomfortable they were in dealing, now granted they were, they were analysts, they weren't people who were out in the, in the field, they were, they were sort of office types. Uh, but they occasionally indicated that they did have to go out and, and speak with, with subjects. Uh, how uncomfortable they were in dealing with this material with so little substantive knowledge. Uh, and after, after this was over, after the session was over, a young woman came up to me and said, do you remember me? And I looked at her, I said, no, I, I have to say I don't. She said, I was in your terrorism course. This was an un my, my undergraduate terrorism course just a few years earlier. Now, it was a good course, but it, it didn't prepare her to be an FBI terrorism analyst. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, what happened after 2001 was that there had, was a tremendous uh, reorientation of not only of government attention, but of, 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 of government resources. And people who had no particular special training were being pulled into areas that they had, to put it kindly, only a superficial familiarity with. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned that one of the changes to the uh, Levy guidelines was the relaxation of supervisory yeah. relationships. <coughs> Uh, it would seem to me that that might uh, have a negative uh, impact on communications between the ranks. I was wondering what you uh, consider to be the thinking behind that change. Well, I think the idea was to give autonomy to agents so that they could follow leads, so they wouldn't constantly have to get approval before following out a, a, a lead so that they could uh, move quickly uh, to uh, make maximum use of information. Yeah? 
I'm, I'm on the list there for the ADC, the Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee, and every once in a while they report the, the, their success, uh, a good job they're doing in dealing with the Justice Department. And I, I don't know anything about it beyond what they're saying, which is at, at that level, they, are, they act as if they're consultants and are consulted about policy. Uh, do you have any idea what? <laughs> well, you know, I think that my guess is that they they probably are consulted about policy. Um, the question is whether that makes any difference, you know, on the street. Uh, whether that really filters down very far. Uh, or whether it's something yeah. that's essentially cosmetic. Uh, yeah. Uh, sort of jumping off of the discretion question, uh, is that sort of, or do you think that the sort of Operation Flex things are coming from sort of rogue agents within the, the bureaus, or do you think it's they're sort of getting orders that come down, but then there's the discretion policy so that it doesn't that, you know, when they get caught hiring Connor, well, it doesn't go Well, that's interesting because the, uh, the lawsuit uh, in, the, uh, in, in the Orange County case uh, named a whole hierarchy of FBI personnel. I can't, I don't have it all here, but I think it may have even gone as high as assistant director. Uh, so there was no suggestion that it was the actions of a of a rogue agent and given the concentration of Muslims in Orange County I would I, I, I would I would I would doubt it uh, I would think that that probably had someone someone fairly high up had probably signed off on it uh, now they might not have known anything about Craig Montiel. They might not even have known his name, but they certainly, I suspect, had signed off on the general conception of Operation Operation Flex. Yeah. I was uh, wondering if during your findings or studies, did you find observe anything that uh, FBI started hiring more Muslim people? They did. I'm interested. What would be their personal relations with their Muslim peers? As a oh, I, I think my 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 feeling is that they're absolutely desperate to have Muslim agents and native Arab speakers, uh, and that the problem is finding them and, 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 and hiring them because they were hiring absolutely enormous numbers of people after September 11th. I mean, we're talking not simply hundreds, but thousands. And I think it was simply a, a, a shortage of, 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 uh, uh, of, uh, of, of people. They certainly have had uh, uh, Native <coughs> Arab speakers. Uh, they simply haven't had uh, enough, and uh, and in uh, and in the right and in the right places. Uh, I don't think it's I don't think it's any discrimination on their part. Uh, I think they just haven't been able to get them uh, at a time when they're in uh, when they're in, when they're in high demand. Now, it may also be that they may not know how to recruit them correctly. That I don't, that I don't know. But I don't think, it's, a, I don't think it, it's because they don't want them. I think quite the contrary. They would love to have them. And in contrary, if they would be willing to work for them. Oh, well, yeah, happen. yeah. That, that's, another, that's another matter. That I can't, I can't speak to. Uh, I, I can't speak to the question of what the working environment would be for them. 
you know, it's I, I you know, I I've done some consulting for the FBI on domestic <coughs> terrorism, uh, which obviously doesn't, you know, didn't involve Muslims at all. Uh, my sense is that it's a, it was, first of all, it's an enormous organization. Secondly, it's a highly compartmentalized organization. So what may be true of one segment of the organization may not be true of, uh, of, of, of another. So what may be true of people dealing with Islamic terrorism may not be true of people dealing with uh, bank robbery or domestic terrorism or kidnapping or something else. Uh, so, you know, I can't, certainly, I can't recall what the size of the organization is, certainly over 100,000 people. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's an organization in which uh, I think to a certain extent different segments of it have different organizational cultures uh, and that may have an impact on what the working environment would be for, let's say, Muslims in a particular branch. Yeah. So as the community outreach program continues, um, would you say, how would you advise Muslims in the community to deal with this, this outreach? Well, I, I think, I think they, they have to have reasonable expectations about who they're talking to. Let me give you, let me give you another example of the outreach. That after, after the Oklahoma City bombing, um, obviously, we just passed the anniversary for that. After the Oklahoma City bombing, there was an outreach program for militia groups. Um, a lot of people don't know about that, but the FBI went to these paramilitary groups and they said to them, look guys, as long as you stay within the law and, you know, don't, don't Kill people, don't set bombs off, et cetera, et cetera. We will not hassle you. What we would ask of you is if you hear anything about people doing bad things, could you please pass it on to us? And that was a very useful program, and it had a real payoff. But of course, in, that case, in the case of that program, you didn't have a cultural divide between the FBI and the people they were talking to. You say, well, maybe there was a kind of a cultural divide. But basically, they're talking about talking to people with whom they can communicate fairly easily. In 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 the case of the Muslim outreach program, they're talking sometimes to people who are. Uh, recent immigrants, they're talking across a religious divide. Uh, they are trying to sound as though they're tolerant and knowledgeable about Islam when in fact they often have only a very superficial knowledge. Uh, there was a case, I'm trying to think of whether it was in Seattle or somewhere else, where there was an outreach program, and it began with a PowerPoint presentation that had all kinds of stereotyping of Muslims, and it was a disaster. Uh, so, so you're talking about trying to communicate across a, a divide um, where the people who are doing the communicating are, are pretty unsophisticated about the people they're trying to communicate with. And I, I would suppose that uh, Muslims who are, in a sense, the targets or recipients of that communication have to have reasonable expectations, but that's asking a lot. Thank you. 
define reasonable expectations. That, that, you know, say, well, you know, the, the people who we'll be meeting with really don't know very much about us and may make insensitive comments and they're doing the best they can, but we shouldn't expect very much from them. Uh, and uh, they may say things that hurt our feelings, but we shouldn't get too angry with them. Now that's, again, that's asking an awful lot. Uh, and, uh, you know, to kind of, to base a program on uh, your recipients having those expectations may, may be unrealistic. That's one more call, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Fear of entrapment, what level, what degree? That, that Muslims fear that they're going to be entrapped by these? Oh, I think that's probably there. Uh, what I would like to see, I don't know if anybody has done it, is some kind of study of the nature of and content of rumors in the Muslim community. Uh, in other words, what what, what's the grapevine saying? Uh, what are the uh, uh, what's what's the word of mouth on uh, on, on on this? Uh, uh, you know, I, one of my one of my uh, in fact my very best undergraduates is now a. Uh, an intellectual property lawyer in the Bay Area. And the last time, several years ago, the last time I met him, he said, in fact, what said, well, we all we all know who the infiltrators are in our mosque. You know, we all know who the who the who the FBI spies are. Well, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if he's right. Uh, but but you know, there there there's. Uh, uh, th there's there's going to be a culture of, of, of rumor uh, that's out there, and I don't know if anybody has really delved into that. And to the extent that it's out there, it obviously works against whatever the FBI is trying to do, however laudable their motives might be. Uh, now, it seems to me although uh, they would say I'm naive. It seems to me what they should have done is no surveillance at all and only outreach and simply doing everything they could to stimulate the flow of communication from the Muslim community and not doing anything to lead people to think that uh, that they are the objects of spying or infiltration. But of course they were trying to do two, two things that were at cross purposes. And that was, I think, disastrous. Yeah? Well, that gets to the idea that they're not trained to do prevention, so if they're supposed to do prevention, then a sting operation becomes a way of preventing it. And and that yeah, gets you into yeah. the, the, uh, all kinds of yeah, I mean, you're right. You're right. I mean, this that whole prevention thing that that Ashcroft put in place, and you know, it, when you read Ashcroft's statement, he's saying in effect, prevention is our first priority. That's the most important thing. That's more important than catching the bad guys. Is preventing them from doing bad things in the first place. Well. If that's if that's the most important thing, uh, then gaining the confidence of the community is uh, that that's that becomes a secondary uh, goal. Uh, and uh, you know, I think it, it it caused a lot of mischief. Yeah. If I may ask one question. Yeah, sure. What do you think uh, is the most probably effective way? Let's say. In general public to understand that separation between Muslim and terrorism, because
because there is very much generalization about uh, wrong perceptions in terms of with Muslim and associated terrorism, and, and that's no. kind of many Muslims struggle with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in the first place, there's been very, very, very little um, terrorism from. Muslims living in the United States. So the amount of, of, of threat coming from Muslims actually living here is approaches zero. So that's 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 the that's 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 the first thing. Um, secondly, uh, I think and this remains very difficult uh, to convince people of. I don't think you can define a religion in essentialist terms. That is, you cannot say Islam is this, this, and this. Christianity is this, this, this. Judaism is this, this, this. All of the great religious traditions have multiple variations. And you can't simply say it's there's only one kind of Islam. Uh, and and trying to trying to get that into people's heads is very difficult because Islam has been present in the United States in in significant numbers for such a short period of time. That's why I'm saying if if the if the big wave of Muslim immigrants had taken place 50 years earlier, or better yet, 75 years earlier, things would be a lot easier. But you know, Americans are really ignorant about Islam, and uh, uh, you know, uh, it's going to take a long time to educate people. Uh, Unfortunately, yeah. So my dissertation project is actually about the development of sort of the surveillance state, and so I'm interested in sort of the the period between the Church Committee findings and the Levy guidelines, and then sort of 9/11. Did did we actually see like a a significant drop off in these sort of infiltration efforts and surveillance efforts, or did it just sort of get driven underground because now it wasn't official policy? Um, was it sort of something that went away and then 9-11 was like, uh-oh, we got to start doing this again? Oh, I, I think the general feeling is that there was a real reduction. There was loosening, uh, well, I'm a, well I'm, I don't want to reverse completely, I'll, I'll reverse partially. Uh, uh, but, but, I mean, there, yeah, there was, uh, there was some loosening, uh, under, you know, William French Smith and, and others, but, but I think there really, there really was a, a sense that, um, uh, that, that certainly the, the Bureau, began to behave itself, and it, it wasn't, uh, uh, it, it, it wasn't involved any longer in this mass collection of political in intelligence. Uh, so, so, you know, I, there was a kind of immunizing effect of, it, it wasn't, just the Levy guidelines. I think it was the whole complex of Watergate-related events uh, of the uh, of the early and, and mid '70s. Oh, we can't let that kind of thing happen again. But you know, the problem with uh, with uh, those kinds of crises is that the immunizing effect does wear off. People forget. They get lax. And, and, and so on, but yeah, I think it lasted for certainly a good 20 years. Uh, uh, 
uh, so we got we did get something out of it. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned earlier that uh, the incidences of, of domestic Islamist inspired terrorism has been fairly low to nil. Um, and one of the things that kind of strikes me is that in terms of the domestic surveillance efforts by FBI and others, it's not only misguided, it's kind of disproportionate at least to the sort of threat that we've seen actualized. So I'm kind of wondering, is that driven um, by a genuine perception that there is a threat out there that needs to be discovered? Or is it just a political sort of cover your ass type motivation going on there? Mm. Good question. Or if we can do things, these things, we will do them. Uh, I mean, I assume you're talking about things like the Snowden revelations. Uh, to an extent, uh, I mean, that sort of goes broader to the domestic surveillance in general, but uh, sort of focusing more about the, for example, the FBI efforts with, with the, the Muslim community. Uh, if you go to places like just even like France or to Britain, uh, you've had actual cases of uh, you know indigenous Islamist inspired terrorist acts, yes. and there, there is definitely a threat there. If you look at the U.S., it seems like a very different picture. So, what is sort of motivating this sort of paranoia on the part of organizations like the FBI to say we have to spy on these people? Do they actually think there's something to be found, or are they just trying to cover their ass in case yeah. something happens? Yeah, and call yeah. Oh, I them? see what you mean. Uh, I, yeah, I, I think I, I think there is some feeling, and I, I'm, I have to say I'm speculating. I'm I'm speculating here. In the first place, I think there's some there, there, there's some feeling that well, if there are these real threats in places like Britain and France, is it not possible that they could also come here? That what would what makes us immune? So I think. I think that's part of it. Secondly, one of the unfortunate things about 9-11 is we very quickly, and not without, not with a lot of thought, created a terrorism, a series of terrorism-focused bureaucracies. So we've got uh, uh, director of national intelligence. We've got uh, the uh, oh, what's the other title? Why am I blanking out on the other guy? The national security advisor. No, 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 no. NCTC national. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, there were a whole there were a whole series of parallel ter uh, terrorism related bureaucracies that were created in roughly the years 2001 to about 2003 or so uh, that are somewhat duplicative, somewhat ironically, because a lot of the feeling was, well, we've got to eliminate all this duplication. So we eliminated some duplication, created other duplication. So you've got a lot of people who have the function of looking for threats. That's, that's their job. Well, if you've got people whose job is looking for threats, they will find threats. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's in the nature of it. So um, we're we're kind of we're 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 kind of uh, um, saddled with uh, with a uh, with a governmental apparatus that is threat oriented, uh, and it's going to be around for for a long time whether the threats are actually there or not. In the same way that we had a. A, a, a Cold War oriented apparatus that was there regardless of what was actually happening with the Soviet Union. And it takes a long time for things to get disassembled for apparatuses 
within bureaucratic structures to get this assembled to reflect changes in the world. Well, thank you. I want to respect your time.